Hello, welcome back to another Ubuntu Engineering Live session. Uh, we're a little bit short today. We've got MWC going on in Spain, and some of our coworkers are there. I think some others may be sprinting this week also. But you've got Popey, Wupash, and I, so you can still ask us any questions. We will do our best to answer as many of them as we can, uh, given the time that we have and the fact that there's only three of us and we don't know about things like the servers. Uh, so we will do our best for that. Uh, if you're watching this uh, on UbuntuOnAir.com, right down below the video, you will see a chat box where you can log into our IRC channel, which is hash Ubuntu-on-air on the free node IRC. And in there, you can ask us any questions that you have. If you start your question with the word question in all capital letters, it'll turn bright yellow in my IRC client. That way, I don't miss it. And we will go through them in the order that they come in. But first, we're going to go and uh, give some updates on the things that we've been working on uh, so that you know what we've been doing the past month, really, because we didn't have one of these last week, and the, or two weeks ago, when we should have. And that's because I was traveling to the Southern California Linux Expo, which I will get to in my update. So to start us off, we will uh, get an update from Alan Pope on the uh, Core Apps projects. or not. So uh, Alan's been having some browser issues lately. <laughs> um, while we wait for him to realize that he's frozen and rejoin, uh, we'll move on to Wukash to get an update. OK. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, it seems that, uh, oh, browsers. Well, OK, so from my side, it's uh, maybe not as exciting as it would be from, from Alan's side, because uh, Alan usually has something to uh, well, something to show that you can actually touch and, and interact with. Uh, but from the release team's perspective, uh, and concentrating on on touch, there's like um, a few things going on. So, um, first of all, we're we're proceeding releases of Ubuntu Touch according to our uh, schedule that we that we made. So we plan to release an OTA, an official OTA, to the stable channel every month. That that happens at the end of every month, basically. Uh, so this is what has been happening since, uh, like, at least the last month. So after we we got, uh, we had an image for, for, for January, we had an image for the end of February. So now, um, well, we will plan to have another OTA around the end of March as well. So this is the overall plan. and. Everyone that's using the stable channel, uh, well, can can use a well-tested, uh, and we'll we'll get a well-tested update every month at least. So we have also we do basically um, some internal milestones every two weeks. So every two weeks, like so, uh, the next one is in. Well, we'll work on the next one uh, next week. So we create so-called RC. Uh, milestones and RC images. Those are also tested. The same the same testing is is done on those as as we do it for the OTAs for the official updates to the stable channel. But we just uh, push those to the to an internal RC channel currently. So um, in the landing emails that I sent out, there's the exact channel name for the RC for the RC channel. But we don't recommend using those yet because uh, the naming might change. Uh, one of one of our uh, release uh, release members is working now on actually getting all the channel names well standardized because we have like many different channels that we don't even use uh, the naming is inconsistent so this is being worked on so so the name of the channel will probably change uh, uh, pretty soon so if you want to have a stable system and have monthly updates it's best to stick with uh, with the stable channel. Uh, that we use. So so far, we had uh, one OTA released and uh, another one at the end of this month. Um, most of the things that changed were bug fixes. We're working full time on, on stability, not only for Ubuntu RTM but also for Vivid. So as as you know, there was an ongoing discussion that we wanted to have actually um, the Ubuntu RTM um, based system to be changed to Vivid. So the decision has been made that the switch will happen as uh, as soon as possible. QA already started doing tests on 
on um, on Vivid because we we not only need to have a stable macro for Vivid now we also have to have the Krillin devices so so DBQ devices to be um, as stable as uh, um, as the RTM branches are so so far the testing will resulted in not so super results I would say there's still a lot of work we need to do before we can do the switch so everyone is now concentrating on fixing the biggest blockers for that and once it happens we will we estimate that it will happen around the end of the month we will switch RTM to Vivid and uh, well in the end um, everyone will get the, the biggest goodies uh, from Vivid in their stable phones because if we switch um, RTM to Vivid this means that one one of the next OTAs will be probably based of Vivid so we hope that this will happen really really soon um, so uh, from other news we also had Qt 5.4 landing so Timo did a great job because uh, well he packaged tested and well with the help of QA of course um, finally landed Qt uh, 5.4 I think it was uh, two weeks ago I guess with uh, this landing didn't result in in any serious problems. There were a little um, gimmicks here and there, but but now it's working all flawlessly. Um, so we we did it in time before feature freeze. So no feature freeze exception was required. So now both desktop and touch for Vivid have Qt uh, 5.4 um, enabled. Uh, we also wanted to, well the plan was to actually switch to 5 uh, 5.4.1 as soon as possible because that has been released by, by upstream. Um, we didn't make it before feature freeze but there's a feature freeze exception that has been granted by the release team for getting this this in. But it seems that, well, at first Timo when, when he was preparing all the packages everything seemed to be smooth but then it seems that we have a, s a slight regression, well, slight regression in the OSK, the slight regression being that the OSK doesn't work at all. So it's being Worked on right now, but once that's uh, what's that once that's actually solved, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to um, release uh, 5.4.1 um, to Vivid as well. This is uh, an important thing because we would like to be as as tightly um, up to date with what upstream Qt upstream is doing. So this is why, well, the 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 latest version we use, the better it is, and there's like a lot of uh, different memory leak uh, fixes in, in this release, which we would like to have, and not being stuck with with an old version of Qt for too long in a cycle. But this is uh, this is something that we're working on, and it might land pretty soon. So from from other things, is, as I already mentioned, Vivid is in feature freeze. Um, so this means that uh, well, everyone should basically con concentrate on. Uh, on stability and bug fixes, which is what we exactly want to do for Vivid. Normally, touch packages had a standing feature freeze exception, um, which enabled us, well, the development of touch and desktop next to continue even though the feature freeze was, was in place. So we don't have this blanket exception yet. Um, we're trying to, well, right now it's not a big deal because we anyway want to have um, stability First of all, so we want to we want to land as many bug fixes and stability fixes, not change anything in the features. But considering that uh, everyone already knows that uh, that the uh, May well Meizu phones that we that we're demonstrating on uh, MVC are are so to say live, uh, there might be some modifications that might be needed, well feature wise as well, because this is like enabling a new phone. So a feature freeze exception might be really useful here because otherwise it's a um, paperwork nightmare to fill in a feature freeze exception for any any change that bigger change that we want to do. So we're still working on that, but for now, all, every developer, every touch developer needs to remember that we can only land bug fixes and stability fixes without changing existing features without a feature freeze exception. But that's fine. So well, this is this is it and. Um, we, as I mentioned, we're working on Vivid stability. So, so far, also in the landing emails, there's not much we can actually uh, talk about, about new things that 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 land in, in Vivid or RTM because, uh, well, it's it's all to make the battery life better and to fix existing crashes, make autopilot tests and automation better. 
this is one thing that we also um, this uh, these uh, three or four weeks now we're trying to to concentrate on is getting our automation back up shape um, since uh, because of well the, all the tight deadlines we had upstreams were also didn't concentrate too much on the automation itself we know the automation has a lot of issues sometimes while running the other part tests isn't as as easy as it should be and sometimes for instance we still see that um, local testing can give different results than automated testing that happens like in the dashboard of smoke testing but but we're trying to get uh, we're working with CI and the QA teams to actually um, get things as best uh, in, in such a shape that well both local and automated tests will run the same procedures and we will get the same results for both but yeah this will still take some time until we we can get our automation back to to like a completely green state we didn't we weren't able to get to that point in the last cycle but maybe maybe the next one will be better we'll see so yeah besides that it was an exciting month because uh, we well some of you probably already ordered your BQ phones with the one to touch uh, there's also the uh, those that are attending like MVC or or are following what's happening there you, you could also see the Meizu phones th that we're working on also so it's really exciting and I'm pretty sure that then the next months will be even more exciting because of all the goodies that, that we've got prepared okay and I think that's more or less it all right so you mentioned that uh, we already had one OTA update to the BQ phones and that a second one is uh, about to come out. And one question we get a lot when we talk to people about this is how these updates are delivered and who is responsible for delivering them. Uh, on Android, people tend to get stuck with old versions because their uh, OEM doesn't update the images that they ship on their phones. Can you explain briefly uh, how we send out updates to the BQ phones and what part of that is done by Canonical and what part is done by BQ? So basically, well, all the updates parts are done by us. So when we release an update, an OTA update to the stable channel, this is basically what the users of BQ phones will get. So um, there's there's no worry here that, for instance, OEMs might, uh, at, at least in the case of BQ, that that uh, people that buy BQ phones will be stuck with old systems. No, this is this is like we have uh, we have our own own channels, and those channels will be used for every device that that we ship. So there's no risk that actually um, uh, that actually well someone buys a phone and after let's say a year you don't get any more updates. At least this is the plan. This is the perfect plan that we want to follow and I'm pretty sure we'll be able to do that till the end of uh, of our uh, Ubuntu Touch life cycle. Alright, and even when we switch to uh, Vivid Base, those will be delivered uh, to BQ users as an OTA update also, right? Yes, yes. This is exactly why um, we're putting and why, we're, why there's that haste for Vivid quality right now because uh, in the past we were concentrating that okay Vivid was more like a Maco um, platform because this was for the developers with the uh, latest things we had Ubuntu RTM for Krillin so now we actually want to have Vivid also working on Krillin because we know when we do the switch uh, of RTM to Krillin well, all well BQ devices will have Vivid as well. BQ devices and all the other platforms that we will release uh, to in the future will run Vivid and then if we open up another another um, series we will switch then to that. So this is like well you can say this like a rolling rolling thing here. Okay and Krillin for those who don't know is the device code name for the BQ phones so whenever you hear him talking about Krillin he's talking yeah. about the BQ. <laughs> All right, uh, we've had a couple questions come in. Why don't we answer some of those, and then we will go on to Popey's update. Uh, the first one is from Jess Caracas. He asks, when will the Maizu phone ship? And I haven't heard anything about a shipping date come out of MWC. Have either of you heard anything about that? Uh, no. No, I'm, I'm not aware of any dates. Sorry. Okay. 
Yeah, I wasn't sure if they were going to announce actual dates those were going to go on sale or not, but uh, it sounds like they haven't. In that case, we're just going to have to wait for Maizu to tell us. They like to uh, to tease us, it seems, uh, keep dropping hints until they're ready to actually spill the beans. All right, so Nanek asks, as I remember, it was not possible to try Ubuntu Next on VirtualBox. Has anything changed or will be changed for VirtualBox testing? Huh. This is where this is the place where we would um, we would appreciate someone from the Unity team. So I'm not sure if there was anything. Yeah, having a quit here might have helped, but he's at MWC. I don't think you can at the moment. It's dependent upon Mia working on the virtual box video card or virtual video card, and I I don't think that's changed. Yeah, I think it's the same kind of problem. Every time we have a new Xorg it doesn't work in VirtualBox for a little while because they have to update their uh, Xorg drivers for their virtual card that they present. And so they're going to have to do the same thing to produce a, a mirror, or really, I suppose, an EGL driver uh, to make mirror and Wayland work. All right, Night Nightmare asks, are there plans to allow media to be viewed within scopes instead of opening another application to view? So they are a little bit. You can preview um, images full screen from scopes, and you can preview a little bit of uh, music tracks from within scopes. So there is some of that there already. I don't know what the plans are on expanding that. It wouldn't surprise me if we were able to like preview a video within a scope at some point. But I don't really know any details on that. So um, joining hash Ubuntu-Unity or hash Ubuntu-Touch. Uh, you might have better luck finding somebody who can answer that. And again, Nightmare asks, when can we expect to see OS integration between Ubuntu Touch platforms, phone, tablet, and desktop? So last week, Will Cook produced this really amazing video where he showed off Ubuntu running on a Nexus 7, I think? No, it was... Um, it was an Intel tablet that he had connected to um, a Bluetooth mouse. And whenever he switched the Bluetooth mouse on, the tablet would enter windowed mode, so it would act like a desktop with traditional windows. Uh, and he also showed off, I think, a Nexus 4 connected to an external monitor doing the same thing. So we're starting to see some of that already start to land, at least in trunk. Hang on. <laughs> Sorry, I have a new puppy, and she likes to talk. Uh, so we're starting to see some of those features already. They're in development branches. They haven't landed, and they're not in the device images yet. So I would expect probably once we start on the 15.10 release, since uh, Vivid is now frozen, uh, once the 15.10 archives open up, we'll start to see some of that land. And I would expect by the 15.10's release, we will have something that's... Uh, at least something that you can use and try out if not ready to switch to full-time. All right, so keep those questions coming. Again, please don't wait until the very end. If you wait until five minutes before we're supposed to end the broadcast, we're not going to get a chance to answer your questions. So please ask them as you think of them, and we will come back around and answer them. In the meantime, we're going to try going to uh, Mr. Pope again to get his update. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Cool. So I thought I'd do a, a core app update with a bunch of uh, screenshots. So um, <clears throat> one of the apps that we've updated is the terminal. Um, if you're using a, a Nexus device running Ubuntu, then you'll probably have the terminal pre-installed and just do an over-the-air update, and you'll get the latest one. If you're using um, a big, if you're lucky enough to be one of the few people. Uh, who have a BQ device, then you'll need to install it from the store. Um, it's not installed by default on the, on the uh, BQ devices. However, the thing that I wanted to uh, focus on was the little bar above the keyboard. Um, we've had a, a significant update to this uh, terminal. Filippo's been working on this. We wanted to have a configurable keyboard overlay uh, because a lot of the time there are applications you run in a terminal that have special keyboard uh, combinations and um, it's um, 
not all of those keys are presented on our standard on-screen keyboard. So, for example, the control key isn't available on our on-screen keyboard. So we add this overlay keyboard on top. Um, and up until now, we've pre-filled this um, with a bunch of um, commands that we thought were interesting and useful in various use cases. And we asked around to find out what people were running. Uh, what we've now done is made it configurable. So you can create your own bar above the keyboard that you put in whatever keyboard shortcuts or commands that you uh, use on a regular basis. So if you're a, a keen v VR user or Vim user, then you might have one set of keyboard shortcuts. If you're keen on Nano, then you'll use a different set of keyboard shortcuts. And so you can create your own. And there's a little directory that you can put them in, um, which uh, gets read when the terminal is started up. And uh, you can have more than one of them. You can have a whole bunch of them installed for different applications. So you can have one for MUT, one for Vi, one for Emacs, one for Nano, you know, all, all different um, keyboard overlays. Um, and you pick, you pick which one you want active at any one time, because there's only one active at a time, with the little orange button on the left-hand side that looks like a, a, a keypad. And when you press that, um, hello. When you press that, yes, you get a little menu pop up like this. So each one of those keyboard overlays has a short name. So for example, there's one there called Vim, uh, but you can um, you know call them anything you like. Um, and when you press on the orange button and then choose a different keyboard, it changes. So for example, there's the Vim keyboard overlay with the kind of things that you're likely to want to use in in VI in the terminal. So the idea is you create your own, um, and if it's something you think is super useful, then uh, let us have a copy. It's a simple config file in JSON format, really easy to understand. There are some shipped with the terminal, so you can just you know copy and paste and edit them um, at will. Uh, but let us have a copy of the good ones, and uh, we may include those in a later update of the terminal. We're generally only going to include ones which um, are useful for people um, with pre-installed applications. So for example, Vim is pre-installed on the device, so it would make sense for us to have a decent Vim uh, keyboard overlay, whereas you know something like MUT isn't pre-installed, so it wouldn't make sense for us to have that by default. But you can put your own defaults in your home directory and it'll get read on startup. So that's quite cool. Filippo has, um, has blogged about this, um, and um, so yeah, it should be um, quite useful for people. The next app that uh, has been updated and we'll be landing in the store very soon is the document viewer. Um, Stefano's worked really hard on this. Um, he's changed some of the design and the way the app works and performance, and he's done an awful lot of work here. Um, we landed our, our final update yesterday, um, and I sent a message out last late last night to the translation team asking for translations because there's about 20 new strings in the application, and we want to get it translated fully before I upload it to, um, to the store. So um, uh, assuming those translations get done today, they'll get automatically loaded into Launchpad tomorrow morning, and I'll upload the app to the store sometime tomorrow. But just to give you a, an idea of what it looks like, um, we've now got a grid view showing you the most recent uh, documents that you've, uh, you've read. And this is pulling from, oh, I've just noticed a bug. So uh, I'll have to file a bug for this. <laughs> this uh, bit in the middle that, should, that overlaps the uh, the time and the file size. So I'll file a bug about that. Um, uh, it shows you the files that are in the documents directory. So if you just drag PDFs across onto your phone into the documents directory, it will just instantly show up in here. Um, and if you delete them, they disappear from this list. So this is just a view on the documents directory, uh, which is quite cool. Uh, there's also a list view that shows you um, in time chronological order of uh, when you open these uh, these various documents and their file size. And from here, you can delete them as well. So you can just long press and then tap all the ones you want to delete, press the trash can icon, and they're gone. So it's a nice, easy way for you to manage the files that are in your documents folder. Here's an example of a document. <laughs> I thought I'd... Uh, uh, download the uh, manual for the Ubuntu phone and uh, and test that out. Uh, so that works quite nicely. Um, and 
Uh, but also, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you see where it says contents on this screenshot. If you pull up from the bottom, you get the contents if the PDF has uh, an embedded table of contents to make it quick for you to navigate to particular parts of a PDF, which is quite useful if it's a book and you want to jump to a particular chapter, for example. Um, if it's got a table of contents, that's quite useful. Uh, you can also zoom in, uh, pinch to zoom. Um, performance of this has been improved greatly uh, by, uh, by Stefano, who's worked hard on that. Um, it's still not, uh, you know, super fast, but it's uh, it's about as fast as it can get on the the hardware hardware that we have. There's also a little pop out menu that lets you see the details of your documents. So you can see exactly where this document is located. It's in my documents directory and file size and all kinds of other, you know, attributes about the document. Uh, it's also got a go to option, so you can jump straight to a particular page uh, in the document. Very handy. And there you go. It's jumped to page 25 which is pretty cool. So that's everything I wanted to say about uh, DocViewer. And um, as I said, that should be landing in the store probably tomorrow, assuming all the translations are up to date. And the really nice thing is after sending my mail to the translations team, uh, we got a couple of um, code contributions as well, where there were a couple of strings that weren't translatable. So that was really nice to get a couple of contributions um, overnight uh, just after asking for some uh, some translations so um, it's really nice that people are getting involved with uh, with the doc viewer and you know as with all of the core apps if you're interested in helping out if there's a particular feature uh, that you'd like to uh, see implemented then get in touch with uh, myself on um, IRC or ping me an email or whatever and um, I'll put you in touch with the right people and we'll figure out a plan for getting you involved um, it's quite good fun as well so that's good um, the next one is Reminders, and Reminders has had a massive update, and uh, it's currently, uh, we tested it, we had the QA team test it yesterday because we made so many changes, and because Reminders is one of the default apps on BQ device, we can't just arbitrarily upload uh, versions to the store, we have to get them QA'd first, which is, you know, sensible. Um, and they found a couple of bugs, a couple of crashes, and a couple of user interface uh, gotchas. Uh, which were fixed overnight. We're still working on the crashes, and once we get um, some better stability, we'll um, we'll look at uploading this to the store as well. But just to give you an overview of uh, what it looks like, uh, you have your notes filed into notebooks. These are my personal notes, so ignore anything you see here. There's probably nothing uh, <laughs> important in here. Um, but uh, yeah, you can file all your notes into notebooks, which is quite nice. And then you see individual notes sorted by the date you last uh, edited them. Uh, you can, as you can see by the one at the bottom, you can attach pictures to uh, to notes, and um, uh, you can also attach other things like uh, PDFs and uh, other rich uh, text stuff as well. So that's an example of me, uh, you know, going into one of my notes that happens to have a picture inside it. Uh, in this case, it's chickens. And this is an example of a note that has a PDF file. And this is actually quite a nice example because if I click on that PDF, it goes out through Content Hub to the document viewer. And then I can view that document in the document viewer. So it shows the integration between you know, the, the way we can pass data from one app to another via the Content Hub. And that works really, really nicely. Uh, so look forward to seeing reminders in the store very soon once we uh, once we clear our um, QA requirements. The other one I wanted to mention is Deco. And um, Deco is being heavily worked on by uh, Dan and Boren. And um, it's worth noting there's actually two versions of Deco in the store. Um, let me just show you the store so you get the right one. Uh, if I just screen share something else, hopefully if I press this, can you see this? Yes. Good. Uh, so what you can see here is there are actually two versions of Deco in the store. They've got slightly different icons. Um, check this one out, Deco Beta. Um, the original Deco, uh, which uh, we haven't updated yet, uh, is version 0.3. And the Deco Beta is uh, 0.4 and has the new design. Um, but um, we're not ready to make that the default Deco um, 
until it's had a bit more testing and we've ironed out a few of the bugs. But um, Deco is looking pretty awesome at the moment. So um, yeah, try out Deco Beta. Uh, you can also um, uh, slash Deco. So uh, file bugs or get involved with Deco if you go to launchpad.net slash Deco. Um, there's also an IRC channel, uh, as you can see there, hash Deco on Freenode. Uh, so let's have a quick look at some of the things that are in uh, Deco. Um, back to the screenshots. So yeah, again, this is my personal email, so <laughs> ignore any content you see. Um, so it's it's quite pretty and uh, easy to read, and uh, I really quite like this email client. It's quite nice. Uh, it's got a little pop-out menu from the left-hand side that lets you switch between accounts and get access to settings and add accounts and all that kind of good stuff. Yes, I have a lot of unread email. Um, you can see there the top uh, the top email there shows you when there's an attachment on the email uh, with a little paperclip icon, and it also shows you if there are um, messages that are marked as important with a little with a little uh, icon there as well. Um, this is a view of an email. This is us debugging uh, an email a, a bug with Deco in that uh, uh, it isn't showing the uh, the content correctly, and this is one of the reasons why. It's still in beta. The Deco beta is is the one that we're testing out because you know there are a few bugs in it. So um, set your expectations if you're going to be playing with uh, with Deco. Set your expectations appropriately. Uh, one of the questions we got um, on the Q and A yesterday was how do you move uh, emails, and I had to ask Dan because I didn't know how to do this because I've never actually moved an email in my life in uh, in Deco. You actually just swipe the email to the left. And when you swipe the email to the left, there's a little pop-down menu you can reveal, and you can move messages to another folder. So that answers a question that was asked yesterday, which is quite cool. You can also swipe up from the bottom to reveal the Compose uh, button. And also, if you're in an email, you swipe up from the bottom to reply or reply to all, that kind of stuff. There's that uh, swipe, side swipe to reveal the menu. And that's the menu that appears. Uh, here's an example of uh, you know rich content in an email. I've got some formatted text, and there's some images down the bottom. That's an offer email from my local curry house. Yum, yum, yum. I think I'll have to go there. Uh, and there's another example of an email with some uh, rich text. So the uh, the app is coming along really nicely now. And uh, you know, wh where, we, where we've come from uh, and what it, what it used to be able to do uh, to what it can do now is, is pretty remarkable. Uh, you can also switch view. What I've done here is you can, at the top it says starred. So these are just important emails. Uh, emails that I've marked as important. And I think that's it. Uh, yeah, that's everything. So that's the end of my update for uh, Core Apps. If you want to get involved in any of that, or uh, you're interested in uh, contributing in any way, shape, or form, get in contact with me, and uh, I'll help you. All right, awesome. Does uh, the new Deco Beta support the Content Hub for Attachments yet? Um, I haven't tested that actually. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, good question. Okay. Yeah, because I think the uh, the. I think it does. Yes, actually, I did. Do, I did test that earlier. Yes, if you have a if you have an email that has an image on it, for example, and you tap it, it will fire off to Content Hub, and then you can save that image into your gallery, for example. So yes, that's the short. Cool. All right. We got a few more questions, so we'll go back through those uh, before I get to my updates because my update's not very long. Uh, if you have any other questions you want to get in, you need to start asking them now if you want us to have time to answer them. All right, so going back uh, to Nanek, he said, "I saw on YouTube videos that opening of apps is a bit slow. Why?" So that's uh, that's a pretty complicated question, actually. There's a lot of things that could cause apps to open slowly. Um, if it's a, an HTML5 or a web app, it's going to have to open up a browser instance and get all that loaded up before it can even start loading the app's content. So that can be slow for a little while. Um, you can tell if it's one of those because there'll usually be a loading progress bar up towards the top of the app. If it's a QML app, it's actually having to compile the QML um, before it can display it. So that takes a little bit of time. Uh, there has been work going on to improve that, to uh, both pre-compile the QML and, or to uh, cache it after the first time it's run. Uh, Wukash said something uh, in reply on IRC about 
uh, it being faster after the first boot because it does have that cache set up already and it doesn't have to rebuild that. So that goes to help it a little bit. There's also some things that are going on behind the scenes to set up the process properly to make sure that it's being run under App Armor and uh, Mir knows about it and all of that, uh, which we're constantly trying to improve the performance of so that that doesn't take up as much time. Uh, in some recent videos, you may have also seen apps being launched that are uh, not Mir native apps, so they're going to be running under XMir, which is actually uh, a modified version of the Xorg server. So for those apps, there's more setup that has to go into uh, preparing to load those. So things like LibreOffice and GIMP, those are going to have a, an additional small startup penalty. Uh, but again, we're constantly working on improving that and trying to lower that time so that it's not really vi visible to the user. Uh, Nightmare asks, how much of current Ubuntu Touch build relies on Android technology? Wukush, can you uh, answer that one? Yeah, so it's uh, it's not so easy to answer, but uh, basically the the drivers, like for instance, uh, for for the sensors of every device, and uh, um, well, mostly all the drivers that we have that that basically come from 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 the Android. So this is the parts that we we use through Lib Hybris. But it's still it's still like essential an essential thing um, of Ubuntu Touch, but it's not as much as as we did it in the past because in the past we also used Surface Flinger. Now it's it's, uh, it's at least this one component. Uh, but I would say well mostly the lower bits like like uh, drivers for for display as well and for for sensors and uh, things like like GPS etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is still. Um, done by Android and through the lib hybris uh, interface that we use, but uh, there's not much, and uh, there's there's not much more that we use actually. And that's only when it's running on Android hardware, right? If you're running it yeah. on like an Intel tablet, you're not going to have any of that. Right, right. So it all depends on on where you actually run it. But yeah, for instance, the Maco, it's uh, it's basically that. Okay. All right, just Krakus asks, uh, and I'm going to assume this is for uh, Alan. I saw you edited UUPC, that is Ubuntu UK podcast, recently. When will the new episodes arrive? Uh, soon. <laughs> Very. Um, soon. We're um, we're we're recording the n the next one, the first one, um, this month. Okay. All right, just Krakus again asks, is Deco pre-installed? And as far as I know, it is not pre-installed on either the Nexus or the BQ images. No, uh, because it's not ready yet. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't want to deliver a default application which, you know, has giant missing features or, you know, broken features. So, no, it's not default yet. It could well be in the future. The uh, the design guys have helped tremendously in getting the the design of the application looking really sweet, uh, and uh, it looks a lot better than it used to. I mean, it didn't look bad the first version, you know, that was uploaded to the store, but now it's come along a long way, and the guys are working on it every day. So it's um, it, it, it's one of those apps. If you if you're interested in getting involved, that's that would be a great one to get involved in because email is a is an application that you know everyone uh, seems to want um, and um, and you know we could we could do with more more developers working on that uh, I know Dan and Warren would appreciate the help so Alan I have a question that might might irritate you a little bit but uh, how do you have other pilot tests for deco uh -huh. uh, sorry you're breaking up there uh, Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> Deco is kind of an interesting project uh, because it wasn't it it wasn't part of the original core apps, and it wasn't something that was started by any of us here at Canonical. This was something that was started kind of external to us, and we've just kind of adopted and helped uh, interface with like the design team and everything. So it's really yeah. uh, core apps is this mix between Canonical and community, and then Deco is just kind of on the edge of what core apps even was. And right. Uh, 
the uh, the short answer is uh, no. I don't think we have any autopilot tests for um, for Deco, but. Um, well, it would be. We know. We know what the status is. We both know <laughs> we have experiences with, with automated testing like this. But in the future, it would be nice if we would actually consider actually adding it to the, um, to be pre-installed. It would actually require some at least some basic automated tests that we could run to basically check if for every image if it's actually just if it's runnable at least. So that would be good. Yeah, I agree. And you know, there are there are there are going to be, um, you know, it, it's going to be a complex beast to test. Um, it's I not stand, it's not yeah. straight, uh, and especially as it has to connect to, you know, you have to, we'd have to mock uh, an SMTP yeah. server, an IMAP server, and all that kind of stuff in order to test it properly, or have you know sample accounts and stuff. But it, it gets complicated. But the good right. news is we have experts in autopilot who can help us with that. All right, and one more on uh, Deco from Just Caracas again. Will there be a gesture tutorial for Deco? Um, so things like that long press or uh, swipe to get to the, the move message. Do you know, one of the things that I've always liked about, um, about Ubuntu and, you know, free software in general is that uh, people have, there are people out there who will dedicate their time to creating cool videos on YouTube showing people how to do stuff. And I would expect there will be, once, once people can get these phones in their hands, people will start making tutorial videos and, um, you know, how to guides and all that kind of stuff that, you know, they already do for Linux in general and Ubuntu specifically. And I would expect people would do the same thing. And you know, if people make some really good ones, we could maybe adopt that as a tutorial or link to it from, you know, the application homepage or that kind of stuff. It's I, I, um, so in short, yeah, I would love to see that, but we need to get the app finished first. All right, and because Deco is so popular, we've got another question for that. Is wow. there an Open PGP integration in it, and if not, is it planned? Not yet. Uh, it's something we'd like to do, of course. Uh, you know, there's there's a whole lot of encryption and security related things that we'd love to do on the phone. Um, you know, and that's just one of them. I, you know, we'd love to have uh, fully encrypted storage and uh, you know end-to-end -end secure transmission and PGP in in email and all that kind of stuff. Yes, we would love to do that, but um, we need to get the basics done first. Um, you know, things like being able to show you your email and your attachments and not duplicate your email on screen or you know make it fit on the screen you know the absolute basics we need to get good first but yeah we have a we have a view to wanting that definitely and if uh, you're interested in helping with that uh, you can always join hash deco and talk to the guys there um, or you can go uh, to deco's upstream which is the trojita project I know that they've got on their list uh, to add some PGP support. Uh, so if that, that gets built into the core of Trojita, then uh, the Deco guys should be able to take advantage of that also. All right, moving there along. Are, sorry, there are, other, there, are, there are things that, you know, I'm not sure I would want to put my key on a phone that I can't encrypt, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So there are, there are, there is like a chain of dependencies we need to have. Um, you know, we need to consider um, before we could uh, implement that properly. All right, programmer asks, can I run every Ubuntu desktop application on Ubuntu Touch? Uh, the short answer is no, not right now. Uh, you can see videos that have been posted uh, running GIMP and LibreOffice. Uh, so there are going to be ones that you can run. Uh, that's all in development branches right now, so you can't currently do it with the, the latest stable version of Ubuntu Touch. But in the future, you will be able to run more of those. There are some that are just plain not going to work, like uh, the screenshot tool, which depends on X, uh, is not going to work for you. Uh, but most desktop apps will be able to run under Unity 8 and Mirror in the future. All right, Nightmare gets to uh, something that 
Kofi was just talking about. Will full disk encryption be coming to Ubuntu Touch in the future? I, mean, I don't so. know about this one. Do you guys? I, you know, it's it's something we want to have. I think. Um, I didn't hear about any specific plans for that, but I know that it's it's planned, but I don't know for what exact uh, dates. Yeah. All right. Uh, as fast as far. <laughs> Anybody know anything about availability of MX4 with Ubuntu Touch? When did they start selling that phone? So we talked about this at the very beginning. Uh, I guess you probably weren't here for the start of the video. The MX4 is being shown at Mobile World Congress currently, but they have not, as of yet, that we've seen, announced a date where it's going to start going on sale. So you're going to have to uh, be a little more patient and uh, keep an eye out for that announcement. Nightmare asks, considering the relationships Canonical has with business partners, will there be a push in the future for Ubuntu Touch phones in the enterprise? Good question. I don't know that we are currently looking at uh, enterprise-style <clears throat> device management. We don't have the right people on, I think, uh, to answer that. We need to get... Uh, Somebody a little bit higher up the business ladder, I think. All right. That is the end of the questions. I've got a couple short updates, and we've got about 10 minutes left. So if you have any other questions that you want to get in this hour, now is the time to start asking them. If you don't ask them now, we are not going to get a chance to get to them. All right. Uh, so the BQ phones that have been going on flash sale are supposed to start shipping this month. So those of you who were able to get one, congratulations. And I hope that you post pictures and videos of your phone when you get it in hand. Post them on Facebook, on Google+, on Twitter. Uh, use hash Ubuntu or hash Ubuntu phone. Uh, we really are looking forward to seeing that because most of us do not actually have a BQ phone of our own. Uh, some of us who do still have the old Android buttons on them. I don't have one at all. The only time I've seen a BQ phone was Stuart Langridge's uh, at scale uh, a couple weeks ago. So please post videos on that. We all want to see them. And now Alan's going to show us off his BQ phone, aren't you, Alan? Yes. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, jerk. I have one as well, but I won't. But I I won't show it off. Yeah, oh. that's because you're nice, not not like. <laughs> You've got the nice black one. I've got the the white one. So, haven't you? Oh yeah, definitely don't show off the nice black one. I haven't. Yeah, seen it. Oh, there it is. All right, I'm just here with my Nexus Four. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so we mentioned earlier also that uh, MWC is currently going on in uh, Barcelona. Uh, if any of you are lucky enough to go there. Congratulations on that, and again, please take pictures. Uh, there's a bunch of videos and hands-on and stuff coming out of that. So if you follow any of us on Google+, Plus, you'll probably see that. You can go watch some uh, reviews and stuff of the new MX4 phone that's going to be coming out from MyZoo. And then finally, uh, earlier, last month actually, I was able to go to the Southern California Linux Expo, the 13th annual one, which was a really nice show. Uh, we had an UbuCon there where a bunch of us went and uh, gave presentations, which was really nice. So I wanted to thank uh, the scale organizers, Gareth and Elin, and uh, the UbuCon organizer, Richard Gaskin, for putting all that together. I did write up a little bit about it on my blog, so if you go to mhall119.com, you'll see some pictures and uh, description of what all was going on there. We had a great booth uh, at the show the Ubuntu California Loco, uh, as well as uh, a couple of guys from Colorado and Peru came over and helped us set that up and run that. It was a really excellent booth. There was a lot of uh, excitement about the phones. A lot of people came by to, to see them. People really enjoyed the, the swipe gestures. People really seemed to get uh, the concept of scopes once they had a chance to play with them and use them out a little bit. So there's a lot of excitement there. It was a really good show and uh, nice to see everybody that I hadn't seen in quite a while. So if you ever have a chance to go to scale, 
It's in uh, Los Angeles, California, once a year in the uh, late winter, early spring. I would highly recommend you go. That's all of the updates that we have, and that's all of the questions that we have. So we will go ahead and wrap this up, and we will be back again in two weeks for another Ubuntu Engineering Live update. Thank you, everyone, on IRC for your comments. Thank you, uh, Alan and Wukash, for being on the video with me today. Hopefully, we will round up some more uh, members of the Ubuntu engineering teams for the next one. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mike. I'll get back to uh, cut the rope now. <laughs> <laughs> I've got machines versus machines, so, yeah. <laughs> so we're still live, right? Now everybody knows this is what we do all day. <laughs> oh, whoops. Okay. Oh, dear. Bye-bye-bye. Bye. See you.